Hello everyone, Pastor Don Sullivan here. Thank you for checking out uh, our past sermons and other resources. I hope that as you watch this sermon or use the resource we've made available, you'll be encouraged and blessed along with your belonging to your local church family. If you find these helpful, I hope you'll consider giving to Redemption Church right here on our website. Again, pray that you are blessed and strengthened in your relationship with your loving Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ, led by the Holy Spirit. Good morning, Redemption Church. He is risen. He is alive. So happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Sunday to everyone watching online. If you consider uh, Redemption Church your church home, your church family, we miss you. And if you're just checking us out, we're glad to have you connecting with us today. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, uh, I hope one day to have that chance. My name is Don. I'm the lead pastor here at Redemption Church. And so we're going to walk through uh, the, the resurrection story that John tells today. As Josh said, please, please comment. Please, uh, please let us know you're there. Let us know where you're worshiping from. Um, let us know. Uh, we would love to see pictures of your family worship moments. I, I actually am curious. I, I'm curious as to, to know how many of you uh, got up and, and got ready and actually got dressed up for Easter this morning. And, and how many of you, and I'll never know, right? You can comment, but the, how many of you are sitting there eating cereal and, and, and worshiping Easter in your pajamas? Well, maybe not cereal because it's, it's Easter, so maybe you went all in and did bacon. And if you did, that's a good life choice. I commend you for that. But one of the things is we talk about the power of the resurrection today. I, I love that we have <clears throat> a new life in Jesus. And I love that, that how we kind of roll here at Redemption Church is that Jesus frees us from having to... Uh, having to pretend, having to act like things are all, all good. Jesus frees us from having to act like things are, are better than they actually are. Because Jesus frees us from our sin and shame, we don't have to pretend and we can be free and real with each other, and most importantly, free and real with God. So here's the hard truth. We're going to be real for a while together. Here's the hard truth we have to face together today in faith and encourage of Jesus. The Easter is, is just different. This week, I heard several different uh, experts say that this is the first time in the history of Christianity that churches around the world could not gather together on Easter. Now, if that's true, then we probably should feel a little odd. We should feel a little out of sorts. We should feel disappointed. We should feel like this is not quite right because it's not. We should feel like this Easter is a little different because it is a little different different. But we have to step back and, and know that even through all of this, God has been good. And even in this tough reality, God is moving and there are blessings and grace for his people. So think about it this way. Think about your last few Easter's. I wonder if you think about your past few Easter's, if your Easter's were filled with work and stress. Work to get ready for your family coming over. Work to make sure everybody had the right stuff to wear. Work to cook a, a, a tremendous feast for your family. Work to get everyone dressed up and on church, uh, to church on time, which means you were five minutes late instead of ten. Now here's one for you parents and grandparents. Working to fill and then hide about 12,000 plastic Easter eggs, right? Here's, but, but that's only after you've eaten about two pounds of candy for yourself. So you get all the good stuff, and then you leave your kids with like jelly beans. That, that's usually how it goes. Have you ever had to go back to the, to the store to buy more Easter candy because the candy you bought didn't make it to Easter? Or, or, or well, I, me either. I, I don't know what that's like. like. But you have to ask this question. Why are Reese's peanut butter eggs so good? It's just wrong. So take a second right now, just for fun, and enjoy our time together and comment, what's your favorite Easter candy? And if it's not uh, either Cadbury eggs or Reese's peanut butter eggs, you might be wrong, but just think that through, all right? But here's the reality. At Redemption Church, and at most churches, we put a lot of energy and resources into Holy Week, and in particular, specifically Easter Resurrection Sunday. That's been taken away. And that's not all bad. Because we are once again reminded what we're left with is only what matters the most. And that's the deep core truth that Jesus is alive and God is in control. Nothing has changed. Even it seems like everything is changing. So I want you to know that I have been praying this week for your families and my family. I've been praying that God will bless you with the simple but powerful real gift 
of being able to truly worship and enjoy a more simple Easter. As all the stuff that we've added to it gets taken away, we're left with a better focus and a simple but godly enjoyment of Resurrection Sunday with our families. So wherever you are, do me a favor. Just breathe and relax and enjoy the presence of Jesus Christ this morning. So let the kids wiggle. Let them ask their questions. Let them eat their Easter candy. Not the good stuff, just the jelly beans. But let me say it again, most of all, He is risen. Jesus is alive and He is keeping His promise to be with you wherever you are, worshiping Him this morning. So let's get into the resurrection story. We're going to look at John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. And the way John writes his account of the death and resurrection of Jesus, it really is just one story. Josh started it Friday night on Good Friday, and we're going to continue it and finish it today. So John doesn't mention, if you notice carefully, John does not mention anything at all about what Jesus' disciples did between Friday night when they laid Jesus in the tomb and, and Sunday morning early when they go to properly bury him one, uh, for the final time. And I think there's a couple of reasons for this. One of it is just simply uh, a human Think about what your Tuesday was like this week. For most of us, because of everything that's going on, because of quarantine and, and physical distancing, we really can't remember what happened Tuesday because nothing happened Tuesday. And the reality is probably not much happened. The disciples didn't do much between Friday night and Sunday morning. But there's a, there's a bigger, more important reason. I think John wanted to keep the story crystal clear. He doesn't want to add unnecessary fluff. He wants us to stay focused and able to see very clearly exactly what the most important thing. So the disciples knew this. They knew Jesus was dead, and they knew they couldn't change that. And more than that, we have to see kind of the motions in this. They couldn't actually bury him properly because he was killed and taken off the cross right before Sabbath started. So they couldn't even really properly bury him. They couldn't show him the respect they wanted to. John tells us that they basically just quickly placed his body in a borrowed tomb that was nearby. John says that a man named Nicodemus had intended to prepare Jesus' body, so he brought the needed spices and supplies to care for Jesus' body. But, but the way John writes it, it seems like they ran out of time and they couldn't really finish the job. So they just kind of dropped Jesus' body off in the tomb and had to wait until Sunday morning to finish. Now think about that for a second. On top of everything else, the fatigue, the terror, they couldn't even honor Jesus one last time. They couldn't pay their final respects. We need to know that it was very important culturally. It was very important in the Jewish culture that a, a, a body would be honored and properly buried as quickly as possible. And they couldn't do that. So John says that as early as possible, it was still dark on Sunday morning. Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. And when she gets there, all she sees is, in the darkness, all she can see is the empty black hole of the tomb. The stone that she had watched been roll in front of the tomb Friday night was now away, rolled away from the tomb. And all she could see in the darkness was the darker black hole of the tomb. The door had been opened, and the tomb was now wide open. But look at Mary's response. We've got to be careful that when we read this story. We know the ending. They did not. We've got to realize that at no point in the disciples' thinking did they think, well, he's, Jesus is, is to a better place. They never would have thought that. They would have never thought, well, Jesus is with God. They never would have thought that. Here's what they would have thought. Jesus was dead and everything was over. So look at Mary's response. She sees the open tomb, but she doesn't look in. She, she just assumes that Jesus' body is gone and that someone had taken it. Now, here's what we need to see. Like I said, the idea that Jesus is alive not one time crossed Mary's mind. So she takes off and she goes and tells Peter and the beloved disciple, and this is kind of funny, uh, the beloved disciple, which pretty much everyone believes the beloved disciple is John, the one who's writing this story, this, this account of the resurrection, right? Mary runs and tells John and Peter that someone moved Jesus' body and, and we don't know where. So Peter and John, they take off running. And you got, John's writing this and you've got to read the story because it's got a funny guy thing going on. John writes, the other disciple... As Peter's running, John writes, the other disciple, the beloved disciple, me, John, I was faster than Peter. I think that's kind of funny. 
Like that's such a, that's such a guy thing. Imagine you're, if you're Peter and for all of church history until Jesus returns, everybody who reads this account knows that John is faster than Peter. Like, just think about that for a second. So John's probably writing this thinking, yeah, Peter, you may have a more special place in Jesus' plan. He told you you're the rock. We looked at that story a while ago. And yeah, maybe you took a few steps on water, but I'm faster than you. Isn't that such a guy thing to write down? Like, you got to see that. It's kind of funny. So anyway, John writes that he didn't go in right away, but he stood outside the tomb. Peter, he just charges in. He's coming behind, but he charges in no hesitation. And what Peter finds is actually pretty amazing. First of all, he sees the, the claws that, that they had buried Jesus in. They were kind of laying there. But more importantly, they find the face cloth, the, the head covering, not just laying there. John's very specific. He says it's carefully folded up and, and placed in a different spot. Why does that matter? What's John trying to communicate? And this is the big idea with this folded, carefully placed face cover. Here it is. The resurrection means that everything was completely under God's control. you got to picture this. There was no hurry. God the Father raised Jesus back to life. you got to picture this in your imagination. Jesus, Jesus breathes again and life comes pouring back into his body. And he kind of sits up and catches his breath, collects himself... And as he's sitting there, he, he, he folds his face covering and lays it aside. This morning as we sit and worship together, but far apart in the middle of this pandemic, we're constantly bombarded with the reality that things are bad, that people are scared. And, and if we're really honest, we need to realize that we have no idea what the future looks like. But this folded faith cloth, face cloth, in the darkest hour of the disciples' life, Jesus sits up and takes the time to fold the cloth and then leaves the tomb. There's no hurry. There's no frantic running around. Jesus was in complete control of everything that was happening to him and to his disciples. He was in complete control of everything that's happening in your life right now. Jesus is not scrambling to catch up with reality. You and I are scrambling to catch up with reality, but Jesus isn't. He's not running around. He's not frantic. It may look like it. It may feel like it. But Jesus is with you. The resurrection means that Jesus is alive and he is with you. He is with you in this season of, of, of a pandemic and in all the circumstances that are starting to pile up because of it. So let's get back to Mary Magdalene. Honestly, she's one of the most misunderstood uh, people in the Bible. There's a lot of bad information about who this Mary Magdalene was was okay now here's all we know from scripture this is all we know about mary magdalene we know in luke 8 that she was one of the disciples that financially supported jesus also in luke 8 we read that mary had seven demons cast out of her that jesus healed her from a horrible horrific spiritual war and burden and freed her Matthew, Mark, and Luke all write that Mary was with other women at Jesus' crucifixion. She was loyal and faithful and stayed by Jesus' side until the end. We know from this story, John's account, that she was the first one to go to Jesus' tomb. The first person to see the resurrected Jesus. So we can, we can assume probably pretty safely that she was a significant and loyal follower. Here's another thing. In every list of the followers of Jesus, she was always listed first among the women disciples. In every list but one, Mary is always listed first as, uh, um, among the women disciples. She must have been this important, influential figure. But more importantly, the fact that Jesus appeared to her first, a woman, says a lot about Jesus and, and how he viewed his creation, his people, men and women. Like it or not, in this culture, women were significantly devalued. A woman's testimony was not allowed in a court of law. So if we're writing this story, we would expect that Jesus would go to Peter or John, who he loved, uh, and, and reveal himself to a man, any man first, but he doesn't. He first reveals himself to a woman. And then he gives her this mission, I've shown you, go and tell them, my male disciples, what you have seen. This is, we have to see this. This is a stunning and completely countercultural acceptance and valuing of women that simply didn't happen. So Mary's back at the tomb. She's weeping. 
Finally, she brings herself to look inside the tomb. She sees two angels there sitting where they had laid Jesus' body. And she's weeping. And so the angels ask her, why are you weeping? And her answer is just real, just, just straight up. She says, someone's taken Jesus' body and I don't know where he is. Now here, the way John writes this story, it reads like this. You got to picture it this way. As she says, we don't know where his body is. I don't know where Jesus' body is. It seems like something gets Mary's attention. Either the angels kind of indicate that someone's behind her or something moved behind her and she senses it. And the way John re- uh, writes it is she quickly turns around and she sees somebody there. But who does she assume it is? She assumes it's the gardener. Who else would be there so early in the morning before sunlight? Only the gardener would be there. So pay attention to the emotion that John is trying to communicate. She's overwhelmed. She's undone. On on top of everything else that had happened in the last three days, now she can't find the body to properly bury it. And she's so overwhelmed that she can't even recognize Jesus. And we really don't know why. It could be because she was crying so hard and the emotions were so overwhelming she just couldn't think straight. But if we look at other stories where Jesus appears to people for the first time, most of the time, almost always, they don't recognize him. There was something different about the resurrected Jesus that people didn't recognize who he was until he told them who he was. But look how Jesus tells Mary who he was. It wasn't until Jesus says one word. He looks at her and says, Mary. And in that moment, she realized who this person was. Jesus says, Mary. And everything becomes clear. Somehow, Jesus communicates her name in a way that tells her everything she needed to hear. And so Jesus gives her this amazing gift of knowing her, knowing her so well, and letting her know him so well that all he has to do is say her name. My dad, growing up, my dad still does, has a very distinct whistle. And when my dad whistles this whistle, and it is loud, and it is piercing, and will, if you're too close, it will break your eardrums. But it's unique to my dad. And when he blows that whistle, the whole family knows to come. To this day, adult or not, when dad whistles, you come. I think that's kind of what's going on here. Jesus just says Mary's name in a way that only he could because only he knew her, the real her. In fact, Jesus actually teaches about this and talks about this metaphorically back in John chapter 10. He says this. Jesus says the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all, out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. I think that's what's going on here. Mary, apparently one of Jesus' most faithful and loyal and courageous disciples, hears Jesus' voice and knows it's him. So maybe right now, maybe you're sitting at home and you feel all alone. It's a holiday and holidays are not good days for you. You hear this story about Jesus calling Mary's name and knowing that she wasn't alone, that he knew her so well, all he had to do was speak her name. And you're thinking, man, I, that's what I need right now more than anything else. I need someone in my life that knows me so well that when they say my name, it's just different. You need someone who truly knows you and loves you to simply call out your name. Think about this story. Mary goes looking for Jesus, and Mary only finds him when he calls her name. For you and I, Jesus' resurrection means that Jesus is alive for you, for you. The resurrection means that Jesus is alive and one day he will call your name when no one else seems to think twice about you. The resurrection, for in full power, the resurrection is personal to each one of us. Put yourself in this story. Look for Jesus, search for him, and when you do, he will call your name He will be there. So in this season, don't let your fears and confusions and pain keep you from seeing and experiencing the love and the freedom and salvation that's right in front of you. Let me tell you this. Listen to this. Jesus is not playing hide and seek with you. If you look for him, you will find him. 
So seek him, look for him, and let him find you and call your name. Now, this gets us to verse 17, which is honestly one of the most difficult verses in the Bible. It's just strange. So Jesus calls Mary's name and she falls at his feet, grabbing him tightly. And Jesus says this strange thing. He says, don't cling to me. I have not yet ascended to the Father. I'm ascending, but go and tell my disciples that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now there's a lot of opinions about what Jesus means for this. For the sake of time, I'm just going to try and lay it out as simply as I can. Here's what I think this means. What Jesus is saying is, Mary, stop hanging on to me. Stop grabbing me like you're afraid I'm going to leave again. I I will leave again, but not right now. I'm still here with you. So Mary, let go. I'm here. And go tell my disciples, my brothers, that because of my death and resurrection, you are God's precious child like I am forever. So let go. God is in control. My God, your God, Our God is in complete control, and he has been all along. Now, here's what that means for you and me. A couple things. First of all, John says Mary could cling to Jesus. She could physically touch him. She could even hinder him to some physical degree. So what that teaches us is that Jesus' resurrection had a physical reality. Jesus was fully physical, physically human. And because Jesus was physically resurrected, we can believe that our physical bodies here and now, that whatever happens in this life to our physical bodies, we will receive new, perfect physical bodies in eternity. Eternity, heaven, got to see this, is not only a spiritual place, but heaven is a physical place, a physical reality as well. Now here's what that needs to fuel in us. Let's make some connections. Because Jesus was resurrected, the power of the resurrection means that we too as disciples of Jesus Christ will have a new physically perfected and and healthy body again in eternity. What that means is, Jesus' resurrection means we do not need to fear this pandemic. Now let me be very, very clear here. Coronavirus, COVID-19, pandemic, whatever you call it, it's very real, it's very dangerous, and it's very scary. Before this is over, the stats coming out are are shocking. Before this is over, most Americans will know someone close to them who will get coronavirus. And most Americans will know someone who knows someone who will die from coronavirus. I do. Just this last week, I found out that two people uh, that uh, that I know, uh, two people know someone I know have contracted uh, coronavirus. And in a different, totally different story, I just found out just a few days ago that someone that I know, someone in his family member died from COVID-19. So my point is all this. Yes, we need to use common sense. And we need to take this seriously, but not out of fear. We need to take this seriously for, out, of, out of compassion and concern and selfless service to other people. But our physical bodies, our reality is safe and secure because of Jesus' resurrection. We don't need to fear COVID-19. If you're a Christian, you don't need to fear death because Jesus is alive. You are alive in him if you are a Christian. So we don't need to fear in this pandemic. And more specifically, the resurrection means that we can fearlessly serve other people in this pandemic. We can serve people with passion and creativity because we know that the resurrection of Jesus Christ defeated death and guarantees our life after death. So the reality is this, in all of this craziness, we still have a mission from Jesus to make disciples by loving people and serving people and telling people that Jesus died to bring them forgiveness and he lives again to bring them life. But the reality is how we do that mission is changing radically. We need to be creative and we need to work hard. But the mission has not changed. So we can, we can serve and go about mission and be on mission without fear. Next, the resurrection means we don't have to fear the future. And here's the truth. You and I, we, we have no idea what the future looks like. We don't know what life is going to be like in June, August, next week, or honestly, tomorrow. And we have to realize that's always been the case. We're just more aware of it. We feel it more now. We have no idea what Redemption Church is going to look like after this. But I am pretty confident it won't look the same as it did in January. And that's okay. Jesus can build his church however he sees fit. 
It's his church, and he can do what he wants with it. And the reality is the resurrection means we don't have to fear the future, and we don't have to try and go back to what was. This is really important. See, I think Mary sees Jesus, and she immediately thought things would go back to what they were before Good Friday. I think Peter and John do too. Jesus is alive, and so things are going to go back to normal. But Jesus had, I think John talks about that in verse 19 a little bit. But Jesus had no intentions of things going back to normal. That was never his mission. Jesus was alive again so that you and I can have a new life in him. So be careful. Let me say this. Today is Easter. But what about tomorrow? Don't celebrate the life of Jesus today only to go back tomorrow to what you were yesterday. Jesus did not live and die and live again to give you a better version of your old life. The resurrection is so much more powerful than that. Jesus died and lives again to give you a new life of fearlessness and freedom and forgiveness and purpose. Now let me say this. Most of you are watching and, and you, know, you know that you're not a Christian. And we're glad you're watching. Maybe you're just watching because of what you do on Easter. We're glad you're with us this morning. And on Good Friday, you got to picture this. Jesus was dead. They laid his body quickly in a tomb and they watched. Picture this in your imagination. They watched as this giant stone rolled in front of the tomb and you picture it and you see this. You see it settle into place and kind of shudder into its final place. And imagine knowing the, the finality of knowing that the person you had placed all your hopes, all your dreams, all your plans was dead. I mean, really dead. You would put all your eggs in Jesus' basket and he was gone. And you were left with what may be the most painful, lonely, overwhelming question any person anywhere has to ask. It's this. Maybe you've asked it. It's this. It's now what? Now what? Maybe you're asking that question right now. When you ask the question, now what? It almost always means things have gotten really bad. You've lost a loved one. Now what? You lost your job. Now what? Your marriage is exploding in a thousand pieces. Now what? You just got that phone call that has changed your life forever. Now what? When you have to ask yourself, now what? That almost always means you don't actually know. Now what? You don't know what to do. That's what the stone rolling in front of the, the grave, that giant and terrible stone rolling in front of Jesus' grave meant. Jesus had really been murdered. He was really dead, and they were afraid for their lives. Now what? But the resurrection means that Jesus answers your now what? It's one of the most amazing and powerful things, truths about Easter. Easter means that no matter what, you actually know the answer to now what? Because with Jesus, you need not fear death, the future, or the unknown. And it's not because Christians have no pain or suffering. We do. We're like everybody else. Christians are getting sick and dying just like everyone else. Christians are losing their jobs just like everyone else. But if you've asked God to forgive you for your sins and mistakes because of what Jesus did for you, and you believe that Jesus is your Savior and King from this moment on, then you have a peace and a salvation that even death and disease cannot take away from you. You see, the ultimate answer to now what is even though I might die, I will die forgiven and free and I will gain life again in perfect health and peace. So right now, right where you are at, ask God to forgive you and tell Jesus that you believe in him. And if you do that, if you just admit the sins and mistakes you've made and apologize to God and ask Jesus to bring that forgiveness to you and that you'll be uh, his servant as you, as, and he'll be your king and savior forever, let us know so we can help you in your new spiritual journey. But let me wrap up this way. This whole series of stones. We have been every week taking a stone and, and, and looking at it and letting a stone remind us what, uh, what the truth of that we've been listening so here's, here's the stone for this week. Take a stone, if you don't have one, take a stone and write the word alive. Or maybe for you a better word would be free. Okay? Take a small, a small stone and write free or alive or life on it. And then this week, let that stone remind you that because Jesus is alive, you are truly alive in him. And because Jesus died to set you free, you are truly free. Your sins and death have been defeated, and you have a new life of freedom and forgiveness in Christ. So I would say this, live that new life 
Worship Jesus with passion. Love people with generosity. Serve people fearlessly because he is risen. He has risen indeed and you are his forevermore.